let's now discuss the estimators that are used very often in our daily practice. So the first one is the sample mean. So the sample mean, the standard notation for the sample mean is x bar, uh, sometimes x bar n, so this index n shows us the uh, sample size, sometimes just x bar without n, if the sample size is not important for us. Sometimes mu hat is also used. Why? Because mu is a standard symbol for the expected value and the sample mean is an estimator of the expected value. So when the expected value of a random variable is unknown, what we do? We, uh, we get observations on this, on this random variable and we calculate the sample mean. The sample mean is an arithmetical mean of observations. So we just add all observations and divide the sum by n. So find arithmetical mean. Uh, note that most estimators are called like variance is estimated by the sample variance, quantile is estimated by the sample quantile and so on, but expected value is estimated but not by the expected uh, by, by the sample expected value but by the sample mean. So sample expected value is the term that we don't use usually. So the next uh, is the sample variance. So the standard symbol for this sample variance is S squared, sometimes sigma hat squared. And so this is an average squared deviation of observations from the sample mean. And uh, as you can understand just from the name of this uh, statistic, sample variance is an estimator of, of, of a known variance. And um, mind that there are actually two sample variances. Uh, the one you see now is called a biased sample variance, as it is biased, it is a biased estimator. There is also an unbiased sample variance. It is uh, defined with the same formula, but uh, you divide the sum not by n, but by, by n minus one. So if you see the same formula as you see now, but uh, 1 over n minus 1 instead of 1 over n before the sum. So this is an unbiased sample variance. Actually, the difference is, uh, is not so very important, especially for big samples. So if the n, the sample size, is very big, then difference between n and n minus 1 is uh, just uh, of no importance. The third... Uh, a most popular estimator we are using in our daily life. I, I guess everyone, uh, every of you used uh, so this, est this estimator is a sample proportion. Sample proportion is what we use to estimate an unknown probability of, of a random event. So if you don't know the probability of a random event and if it is impossible to calculate this probability directly using some formulas from uh, from probability theory that we know uh, so what do usually what do we usually do we estimate this probability so we repeat the experiment this random event of interest is based on many times n times and then we count uh, how many occurrences of uh, this random event happened in this series of n uh, experiments. And so ma is this number of occurrences and we divide uh, the letter by the uh, previous one. So we, we divide ma by the n. So this is called sample proportion. Uh, so proportion of experiments such that uh, event a occurred in this experiment. And so this is the uh, estimator of, of an unknown probability. Another thing we often deal with uh, when we are doing sampling, when we are doing some observations, uh, is what we call the variational series of the sample. So the variational series is the 
result of ordering the elements of the sample in ascending order. So from the uh, smallest to the largest one. So for example, you go out to the street and you meet 20 random persons and you measure their heights. And so what you get is a sample. Heights of 20 random people. And then you order these 20 numbers from the smallest one to the largest one. And so the result of this operation is called the variational series of this sample. So uh, notation is uh, the indexes in brackets. So x1 without brackets is the first observation. And x1 in brackets is the least observation. And x2 in X2 without brackets is the second, so the, the height of the second person we met. And X2 in brackets is the second smallest uh, height, and so on. So these elements of the variational series are called order statistics. So in other words, we can say that the ith or order statistic is such random variable that is equal to the ith smallest element of the sample each time the the sample is observed each time the experiment is done the observations are done so for example the 15th order statistic is the height of the person that will be at the 15th place after this sample is ordered in ascending order. So is equal to the height of the uh, 15th uh, so short person in our sample. So after we have defined what the order statistic is, we can define a sample quantile. So uh, not only the expected value or the variance of a random variable can be estimated based on a sample. So all numerical features can be estimated, the quantiles also. So the sample quantile of the level alpha is a number that is equal to the order statistic uh, of the number integer part of n times alpha plus one. So square brackets here mean integer part. So integer part of, of, the, of the number that is in brackets. So you take integer part of n times alpha, then you add one, and then you take the order statistic of this number, and this is the sample quantile of the level alpha. Now, what can we do if we want to estimate not uh, just an, a numerical feature of a random variable, like uh, the expected value or the quantile, but the distribution as a whole. So we, there is a random variable, we don't know its distribution, and we want to know it, and we have, an, we have observations, and so we want to estimate, uh, we want to estimate the distribution somehow. So the way to describe a distribution of a random variable that is valid for both discrete and continuous random variables is the CDF, the cumulative distribution function. So uh, we can uh, define a sample or an empirical CDF. So sometimes they say sample CDF, sometimes they say empirical CDF. So uh, this function can be defined according to the formula you see now, and so it's more uh, convenient, more understandable to if, if I define it not via formula but via graph. Uh, so you can see that this is a, a, a kind of stairs. So you have uh, elements of your sample on the x-axis, 
uh, actually they are in ascending order naturally here that is why their indexes are in brackets so x1 is the smallest one x2 is the second smallest one and so on so you just mark all uh, all elements of your sample at the x axis and then in each of these points your uh, there is a stair and the height of this stair is equal to 1 over n so the heights of all stairs is this are the same they are equal uh, so if some observation uh, is met just twice for example so if you have uh, if you measured heights of random persons of random people and so the accuracy is one one centimeter and so you have two people two people that are 172 centimeters tall so that means that actually you have two observations of the same value and so the height of the stair is doubled. So not one over n, but two over n. So, but in general, uh, so for each uh, observation, you have a stair of the height equal to one over n. And so you have n observations, you have n stairs of the same uh, height, one over n. So uh, you just go up from 0 to 1 with these n stairs. So when the sample size is big enough, uh, you just uh, can see that the sample CDF is very close to the theoretical one, to the real CDF of the, of the random variable you are observing. So here on this graph, you can see that uh, blue line is the empirical CDF and red, the red line is the real CDF. And so if the number of observations is big enough, the graphs are, graphs are very close to each other. So we can say uh, that sequence of empirical CDFs converges to a real CDF when n tends to zero. When so, the more observations you have, the more the closer the empirical CDF is to the real one. If the random variable of your interest is a discrete one, uh, you can also estimate its table of distribution. So, the table of distribution is such is such a table that you have all possible values of the random variable of your interest there and probabilities and to take these values and so these probabilities can be estimated using the respective proportions so we have already discussed how to to estimate a probability with a proportion so and if the random variable you are interested in uh, is a continuous one so in continuous case we use the pdf to describe the distribution and so the easiest way to estimate an unknown pdf is a histogram so a histogram is a figure like the one you see now and so it consists of several bars and how how it is constructed so you uh, divide the interval from the least observation to the largest one from the smallest observation to the largest one from x n brackets to uh, from x1 brackets to xn brackets into several segments and you so over each segment there is a bar and the area of each bar is equal to the proportion of the sample elements that fall into the corresponding segment. So, for example, if uh, you have totally, you have 100 observations, so you have a sample of the size 100, uh, and if uh, there are only three observations in the first segment from Z1 to Z2, so then the area of the first bar is to be 3 over 100. And so 
if there are, let's say, seven observations in the second segment from Z2 to Z3, then the area of the second bar is 7 over 100 and so on. So the area of each bar depends on the proportion, is equal to the proportion of, of the sample elements. Uh, so, and this figure uh, resembles the PDF. So, if you see a histogram, you can say that the PDF of, of a random variable that is observed uh, is uh, just of the similar shape. It looks similar to this histogram. Uh, there is also another way to estimate an unknown PDF that is called uh, a kernel estimator, or a kernel density estimator, KDE. Uh, it is more accurate as it gives us the uh, curve, not a figure uh, of several bars, as we have here in this case, but a curve. But uh, so this way of estimating is uh, much more difficult. So I won't give you the, the definition if you are interested. Uh, this you can just uh, find this in uh, textbooks on statistics so you should look for kernel density estimator so now let's try to answer how the estimators how the formulas we use to find estimators are evaluated so uh, until now we discussed only properties of, of different estimators. So are they consistent? Are they unbiased? Are they efficient or not? Uh, we discussed uh, several uh, well-known estimators, so, but I gave you the formula. So I, I told you, so this is the estimator of an unknown expected value. This is an estimator of, of an unknown variance and so on. Uh, so, um, but how to derive the formula? How, how did they find all these formulas? How they understood that this is the formula we should check for, for unbiasedness, for consistency, for efficiency, and so on. So is there a, a method that can help us to derive formulas of the best estimators? Uh, there is, there is uh, such a method that is called uh, the maximum likelihood method or MLM and so let's now discuss how this method works uh, in the beginning we, we say that we are solving the standard estimation problem the problem we have already discussed so we have uh, this we have a sample and we know the distribution of the sample elements up to an unknown parameter theta so here we can say that, for example, x1, xn are exponentially distributed with the parameter theta or binomially distributed with parameters 100 and theta or so, and so on. So the sum of uh, some parameter of the distribution is unknown. Or we can say that we have the formula of its CDF, uh, but this formula uh, contains not only the x, the argument of the CDF, but also an unknown parameter theta. So uh, this is the problem. So we have a sample, we have an unknown parameter, and we want to estimate this parameter basing on this sample. So what should we do? The first step is to introduce the, the unnamed function p. So this function has no its own name. There is no a special term to, to describe this function, just p. And so this p is defined uh, different for discrete and continuous case. So if uh, x is, uh, so random variables we are observing, if they are discrete, then p of small x is probability that xi takes the value equal to the small x. So uh, p of small x is equal to the probability of getting this value as a result of our experiment. And if uh, xi's, if our observations are continuous random variables, in this case, uh, the small p is equal to, to their pdf, just to the pdf of uh, xi. 
So as XIs are identically distributed, PDFs are the same and probabilities uh, are also the, the same. So P of XI equal to small x uh, is the same, it does not depend on I. So for x1, for x2, for x3, the probability is um, the same. So after we, after we have defined this function small p, then we defined what is called the likely, likelihood function. So uh, the likelihood function is the function that uh, depends on the sample and on the unknown parameter and is equal to the product of small p's. So this symbol Greek letter capital P, uh, capital pi, is a product. So like the sum, but the product. Uh, so you multiply P of x1 theta by P of x2 theta up to P of xn theta. So each, uh, each uh, element of, of your sample has its, its own element in, in this product. So and then the maximum likelihood estimator or MLE is defined as the maximum point or ERG maximum of the likelihood function. So the theta that gives maximum to the likelihood function is the, uh, the maximum likelihood estimator of uh, theta. So, mathematically, everything seems to be uh, maybe not so very simple, but still understandable. So, what we are doing here, just from mathematical point of view. But let's now try to understand the, the physical meaning of what's going on here. So, um, when we... Let, let us consider an example. So let's say that my observations are heights of random people. So I go out to the street and I meet 100 random people and I measure their heights. And so these are x1, xn, x1, uh, x100. So, and what I'm going to estimate is the mean height, the average height of an adult person. And so let's, uh, let's assume that the height is a discrete random variable. Actually, it is a continuous one, but let's say that we, we measure heights uh, uh, within one centimeter. So mm, that is why we can say that, uh, so the height can, can be equal to, let's say 160, 161, 162, and so on. And let's say the this is a discrete random variable. So, how, what is the physical meaning of the small p, of, of small p of x? Small p of x is actually the probability that the uh, sample element xi takes the value small x. The sample element is the height of a random person. And so, this is the probability to meet a person that is x centimeters tall. So, p of x, small p of x theta, is the probability to meet a person that is small x centimeters tall. Now, uh, let's go to the likelihood function formula. So, what do we see here? We see that uh, so, capital XI is substituted for small x to the P function. What does it mean? What is P of capital X1 theta? So, this is probability, as we know, that P of small x is probability to meet a person that is small x centimeters tall, then probability, uh, then P of X1 is probability to meet a person that is x1 centimeters tall. And probability of x2, uh, p of x2 is probability to meet a person that is x2 centimeters tall, and so on. So, and what are these x1, x2, 
these are heights of pers of people we have already met and measured. So x1 is the height of the first person we have met. x2 is the height of the second person we have met. So uh, what are the elements of this product we see in the likelihood function formula? So the first element is probability to meet a person with its height equal to the height of the first person we have already met. The second element is probability to meet a person with his height equal to the height of the second person we have already met. The third element is probability to meet a person with his height equal to the probability of the third, uh, to the height of the third person we have already met. So these are probabilities to to get the values we have already got. And when these probabilities are multiplied, as we assume that observations are independent, and we know that for independent random events, uh, probability of intersection is equal to the product of probabilities. So when we multiply these probabilities, we get the probability to observe all the values that we have already observed. So uh, this is the probability to meet uh, 100 people such that their heights are equal to the heights of these 100 people we have already met. So uh, in other words, if we generalize this a little bit, so the physical meaning of the likelihood function is that the likelihood function is the probability to get the values we have already got, to get the same sample as the sample we have, to get the same observations, to, to get the observations equal to the obser observations we have already got, to the values, to get the values equal to the values we have already observed. So this is the physical meaning of the likelihood function. And then, so, okay, and why we are trying to maximize this function? So why we are looking for the maximum point of, of this function? Uh, so we say, we assume that our observations are just how to say uh, standard ones. So th there are, uh, if there are some very small or very large numbers in our observations, so their share is not so very high. So, for example, uh, we say that it is impossible that half of these 100 random people whose heights were measured, that half of these people were. Um, shall I say, uh, members of, of a basketball team. So with their heights very, so that are usually very tall. So we can say that it is quite possible that uh, one, two, three, let's say five, uh, five people of these 100 were basketball players, but not 50, not one half. So it's impossible. Or it's also impossible for, for one half of these 100 being, um, shall I say, tourists from, from, from some Asian country, from Vietnam, let me say, uh, so from the country where people are usually short, shorter than here in Russia. So uh, some, I, we assume here that, so we can, uh, we can observe some extreme, some strange values, but their number is not so very high. Their proportion, their share in all the sample is not so very high. So a couple of percents uh, can be some, some strange numbers, some, something that is, is not usual, not standard. Uh, but the majority of the observations are typical ones, are just uh, heights that are typical for this city. And so, after we assume this, we can say that as we are observing some typical values, some values that are often 
um, observed, often met. Uh, if it is so, the probability to get the values we have got uh, is to be not so very low. So as these are typical values, probability of observing such a values uh, should be um, high. And that is why we are maximizing the likelihood function that is equal to the probability of getting what we have got. So we say that as the values we have observed are typical values, then uh, probability to get such a values, to observe such a values, uh, is to be high. And that is why we are uh, choosing theta such that this probability is as high as possible. So, uh, this is the physical meaning of the maximum likelihood method.